Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Okay, we talked last week about Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah 8 is a literary unit with Zechariah 7. One of the major problems in studying the Bible for most people is they never realize a literary context. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Romans 9 through 11 is a unit that can't be split. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is a unit that can't be split. And sometimes the most unbelievable interpretations occur because we do not recognize literary units. And the reason we don't is our Bibles are hacked up into chapter and verse division that make it easy, us, easy for us to find certain passages, but we get so confused by it breaking it up, we think that that's inspired. The chapter and verse division were not done until uh, the time of the Reformation, which is the 16th century. And so it's not inspired, and it really causes a problem sometimes. So if you remember in chapter 7, we were dealing with some men coming from where we weren't sure with a question about religious feast days, particularly fast days that related to different aspects of the fall of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. Now, in chapter 7, the prophet put the real bite on them because of their attitude. They, they came with these religious rituals not because they were worshiping God, but because they felt sorry for themselves and they tagged a religious ritual on their own self-pity. And so ch chapter 7 was a very strong denunciation against religious ritual for the wrong reason. Now in chapter 8, is a series of messages from the Lord, ten of them. And it's almost like a bunch of small sermons stuck together. And um, I think it's going to be a real change in the attitude from last week. But it's one context, so we're still talking about those, feast, those fast days, and we're going to get into them again in chapter 8. So let's look at chapter 8, 1 through 23. This is the closing out of the first section of Zechariah. Um, next time we get together, chapter 9 through the end is a whole different bag of worms, I want to tell you. So this is closing the first section, which is more, uh, well, it deals with imagery for the end time. 1 through 8 is often made allusion to in the book of the Revelation. Nine through the end is often made allusion to in the Gospels, and so it's two radical different messages. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Now you've probably noticed several, several times, not only in this chapter, but all through this particular book, the Lord of hosts. Now the word, the word host is the word sabbat. Martin Luther's hymn, Lord Sabbat, his name, from age to age the same. Now, it speaks of the leader either in a military context, the army, or a priestly context. And so what it's saying is God is in control of the universe, okay? The captain of the army of heaven, the, the, uh, the commander of the stars, whatever you want to say, God's in control is what it alludes to. It's very, very common post-exilic title for God. That means after the exile, all these post-exilic books use this as a title for God. This is what God says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Now, that is a horrendous English translation. Does anybody have something significantly different they could read me in, on verse 2? Okay, let's look at the words then and see what the problem is. The word jealous is a love word. It's only used in context of passionate love. You're never jealous for somebody you could care less about, right? Now, the word jealous, it can be translated jealous 
are zealous with a Z. It's used always in connection with God and the covenant people. There is a love affair relationship between God and his people. That's why God is often spoken of as a husband and Israel often as a wife, or God as a parent and Israel as a child. There is a love affair between them, and this word reflects that. And the passion of love is reflected when God's children go after other gods. It's called spiritual adultery oftentimes, or when it's in a parent context that I taught Ephraim to walk, and yet he will not listen to me. So uh, this is the idea here. Now this is in a Hebrew parallel relationship. Now, Hebrew does not use poetry as we use poetry that try to have a rhyme between the beginning consonants or the vowel pattern or the end consonants. They are, have a thought rhyme. The, the words parallel one another. So the word jealous and the word wrath are in a Hebraic parallel relationship. The word wrath is a terrible translation of this word. It's horrendous. It does not communicate at all what the prophet was trying to say this is not the normal word for wrath this is the word that means to be hot now it can be hot with anger but quite often it's hot with passion and that's what i think it is here he is jealous he is he is uh fevered with passion for his people now that is the connotation now the word zion for most of my adult Bible study life, Zion has been an enigma to me for this reason. I, it means the city of Jerusalem. But when I got to Jerusalem, there are several mountains there. And the mountain that the temple sits on is not Mount Zion. It's Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac. Mount Zion is next to it. We think the original Zebusite fortress, Salem, was on Mount Zion. The King David's tomb today is on Mount Zion. But it came to be a name for the whole area. It's just a way of talking about the holy city of Jerusalem, okay? Uh, for, you might want to see if that word jealous before I leave. Chapter 1, verse 14, it's a, it was repeated there. Okay, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Man, that is one fantastic promise. Let me see if I can just capsule that thing for you. In the book of Isaiah, when the prophet calls the coming Messiah, you shall call him Emmanuel. Who knows what Emmanuel means? God with us. Now, why would the name of the Messiah be God with us? The greatest biblical promise that man has is that he is going to live with God. In the Garden of Eden, God and man were together for how long? We don't even know. In Revelation 22, God and man are back together. The children of Israel recognize the presence of God by the Shekinah cloud of glory or the Ark of the Covenant. It symbolized that God dwelt with his people. Often the verb in the Old Testament is he tabernacled with them. And the promise here is, though the covenant is broken, though God's Spirit, so says Ezekiel, he saw God's Spirit leaving the temple, heading for the east. The covenant was broken. God left. Now this implies that he is coming back. The new temple is about finished. He's going to dwell again symbolically in the temple. And uh, that's the beauty of it here. It's a tremendous promise. You might want to see Exodus uh, 29:45 for another way of what that said. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of, what do you have? Truth? Faithfulness? What do you have? Truth? Anybody have something else? New American Standard has truth. Anybody have faithfulness? Well, I think it should be faithfulness and not truth. And I tell you why. This is the word emeth. This is the word in Hosea where it says, the just shall live by faith. That's that word faith. It's really not the word faith. It's really the word faithfulness, loyalty to. The city will be called loyal, trustworthy, faithful. And that's the idea here. The word truth and the word faithful are really a synonymous concept in Hebrew and I think in the New Testament also. 
Then Jerusalem will be called the city of faithfulness and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. What is the mountain of the Lord of hosts? What does that refer to? Temple. Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem and each man with his staff in his hand because of his age. Now the reason this is a very important thing, and the next verse is going to mention children playing in the street, the people that suffered the worst from the time of siege were the very young and the very old. The very old were forced, marched to Babylon. Most of them did not make it. When they came back, it was too long and hard a trip for the elderly to come. So those who had grown old in Babylon had to stay in Babylon. This is a promise that God is going to be with them so faithful, so long, there's going to be time for men and women to grow old again and sit around uh, the county squares, if you please, in God's city. The beauty of children playing in the street is probably twofold. I'm sure young couples, with the way things were, were afraid to have children. And the other thing is that social life is getting back to normal. How many times Jeremiah talked about the children playing in the streets would have dastardly consequences in the exile. Here again, God is reversing everything he did in the, in, in the destruction of Jerusalem. The old people are back. The kids are playing in the street again. Family life is back to normal. Community life is back to normal. God's blessing rests again on his people. Verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares the Lord of hosts? These people had been in, in captivity most of their lives. Most of these people were born in captivity. They couldn't believe these kinds of covenant promises would come true. There were so few of them that came back. They had such hard time coming back. There were so many problems. And God says, look, trust me. It may seem hard to you, but it's not too hard for me. I'm going to bring it about. Trust me. Trust me. Chapter 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. Now, save my people. There's two things there, both of which are very important. The word save in the Old Testament, verse 7, down again in verse 13, does not mean what you think from the New Testament word. We're not talking anything about what we call salvation in the church. We're not talking about our spiritual lives. We're talking about our physical lives. In the Old Testament, the word salvation is synonymous and equal to the term deliverance. And it means physical deliverance. That's what it means here. The word my people is a special covenant phrase that we're going to see mentioned again down here when it says, I will be, look at verse 8, my people and I will be their God. That is that unique covenant phrase that God has often used with, with the Jews. What they're saying is the covenant had been broken because of their unfaithfulness. God is renewing it now. He's putting it back in place. They're going to be his people again. He's going to be their God again. He'll protect them. He'll be with them. Now, this is from the land of the east and the land of the west. If you have a map in the back of your Bible, you might want to look there at the Mediterranean world. You'll see there really was some significance geographically about saying that God was going to protect them from the land of the east. For to the east of Palestine is what's known as the Fertile Crescent, it is one of the early cradles of civilization. Uh, the Sumerians are the first we know about. Then came the Babylonians and all, of the, all those different groups of people. It came from the uh, Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. So one of the major enemies of, of the people of God has always been those countries to the east. But there are no countries to the west. The other major power is south. So why would he say deliver them from the land of the east and the land of the west when there is no land of the west? Well, this is a figurative way of speaking of the whole earth. It's usually from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Okay, it means the universal protection of God. Let me give you a few verses. They're on your outline, I think. Psalms 50, verse 1. 
Psalms 113, verse 3. So, uh, Isaiah 59, 15, and Malachi 1, 11. Okay? Uh, verse 8. And I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they will be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Now, there's that word, same word again, emoth. And look at the margin of my Bible, says faithfulness. And I think faithfulness is what we're talking about. God is an ethical, moral, people-centered God. You cannot be his people and not live like it. That's what happened to the Jews. They wanted the covenant blessings without the covenant responsibility. No different from us. We want the blessings of God. We just don't want to live for others. We want to come to church once a week and have everything fine and wonderful and be healthy and protected. We just don't want to pay the price to be the ethical, moral, seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day, other people-centered, loving folks that God wants to be. The covenant goes two ways. It always starts in God's grace. God always takes initiative. But man must respond appropriately in his life, in his faithfulness toward others. That's the idea here. Verse 9, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you who are listening in those days to these words. Uh, the problem is they, they couldn't believe this. They had it so bad. It's been so tough. They just was overwhelmed by this. In verse 9 and 10 is God encouraging them. It's going to be better. It's going to be better. In verse 11, it mentions the remnant of this people. There were so few Jews came back compared to all the Jewish people that stayed in Babylon. So few. Um, Verse 12 is a promise of agricultural prosperity again, which was a sign of the blessing of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 27 through 29 are the cursings and blessings from Mount Ebal and Mount Gezerim. When Israel broke those covenant promises, she reaped the curses. But this prosperity, this fruitfulness, was part of the blessing that they were going to have again. And it will come about that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, and that, that just fits right in the context. Remember, if you could in your mind, ever since 922 B.C., there was no united Jewish people anymore. In 922 is when the kingdom split between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, between northern Israel and southern Judah between the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes. The southern two were called Judah. The northern ten were called Ephraim, uh, Samaria, or Israel. And so we're speaking of the fact they were split, and apparently some from both of those groups came back during the exile. So I will save you, Old Testament physical sense, not spiritual sense, that you may become a blessing now, where does that come from? What's that an allusion to, that you may become a blessing? The covenant of Abraham, Genesis 12 and 15. If you remember that covenant, God said to him, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you, and you shall be a blessing to all people. Well, there it is right there. Do not fear. I've often wanted to do a study of how often in the Bible any kind of supernatural message starts with don't fear. <laughs> you know, if an angel popped in your bedroom with a flaming sword, you better hope his first words is fear not too, you know. So that's what God says all the time the prophets say, and I think it's an important thing. We, we tend to tend when we're confronted with the supernatural realm to be paralyzed. And, I, you know, I, I just soon not have it visible <laughs> verse 14 and following for thus says the lord of hosts just as i purpose to do you to ha to do harm to you when your fathers provoke me to wrath i ha and i have not relented now two things god brought that evil on them i don't know how you figure about god and evil but i want you to know god uses evil and he used those godless nations he even calls assyria the rod of my anger and uh, so God is in control even of those horrible days of exile. And then it says, and I will not relent. I would paraphrase it in our day. 
Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap. Sin leaves a scar. You may ask forgiveness, but friends, there's some drastic consequences in this life for living in open rebellion to God. The, the classical example I use is the guy who's been an alcoholic all his life. If he turns to God in faith, God will certainly save his, his, uh, uh, his um, spiritual life. But friends, he may die of problems with his liver. God may forgive you for that ugly, hateful word you said to somebody. But that ugly, hateful word has gone out, and it will rip somebody. So, God, there is a consequence to sin. And if the Bible's true, we're going to reap what we sow. And that's what I think it's saying there, if I had to put it in colloquial expressions. So I have again purposed in these days to do good to Jerusalem, to the house of Judah. Do not fear beautiful word. These are the things which you should do. Now, I've said before, God always comes in grace. God came to these people and brought them back because he said he would, not because they were so spiritual. Let me put it this way, and the good analogy is the Exodus. God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt because God loved them and had a purpose for them. After he brought them out of Egypt, then he gave them the law. The law never precedes grace, but... But, 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 man must respond. God always comes first. God always comes in love. God always comes in grace. But there's always a commensurate, appropriate, spiritual response on the part of man. And that's what he's saying. These are the things which you should do. What God is doing is reiterating the obligations of the covenant. Now, he's he's already blessed them promised he'd do more, but there is a part that man has. That's why people say, do you believe in free will or predestination? Yes, I do. I think it's the only appropriate answer. Okay, speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. Let none of you devise evil in your hearts against one another. Do not love perjury. For all these are what I hate, declares the Lord. Well, this is a very ethical sense. It's a very legal-oriented thing here. The word gates speaks, and the word judgment, of course, and judge. These are law court terms. Now, the gates of the ancient cities were the places where judicial justice was meted out, where deeds were ratified and marriages were uh, made up. It was also the place where you got together to play dominoes and uh, roller skate and climb the trees and chase the squirrels, and that's where the fair came to, and that's where they talked about politics. The gate was the judicial and social meeting place of the ancient cities. Most streets in ancient cities are so narrow. If you've ever been to Jerusalem or some oriental city, they're not about 10 foot wide. You know, in Jerusalem, they can't even stock the downtown stores with trucks or cars. They have to use hand carts because the streets are too narrow to get into. It's where they widen out, usually by the gates of the city. There's a large place for the camels to be and the hay and the vendors and the marketplace. That's what this is talking about. Okay, and then in verse 17, devise evil. That's a legal term. Perjury is a legal term. When it says devise evil in your heart, it's speaking about attitudes. When it says perjury, it's talking about overt acts, criminal acts against people. And, of course, the motive is love, not perjury. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, here's these fast again. Now, I want to write, I think they're on your outline, but let me go over them again. There are four of them. They go back to chapter 7, where these people ask about two of them anyway. There was a fast in the fourth month, a fast in the fifth month, a fast in the seventh month, and a fast in the tenth month. Now, the only fast in the Old Testament is what? Scriptural fast. Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, once a year. Okay? Well, that's not what we're talking about here. These are fasts to commemorate different aspects of Judah's fall. Let me give them to you. The fourth month was a fast when the walls of Jerusalem were finally breached. Jeremiah 39, 2, 2 Kings 25, 3. 
The fast in the fifth month was for the destruction of the temple. 2 Kings 25, 8. The fast in the seventh month was the murder of Gedaliah, who was the appointed Babylonian governor that was doing a good job uh, in 2 Kings 25, 25. And the tenth, the fast of the tenth month was marked the beginning of when Nebuchadnezzar II began to siege the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 39, 1. 2 Kings 25, 1 and 2. Now, those are the fast. That's what God says about them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, cheerful feast for the house of Judah. So love truth and peace. What he's saying is you're not going to be mourning anymore about those times. You're going to be taking those times of mourning and using them for festival. Now, you know what? Something we have really missed in the church. I want, want you all to look at me. If I had to characterize Christianity for the most part, and Protestant Christianity in particular, it's like a guy with a black hat that's cold sucking on a pickle. We have made it miserable. It's an abundance of what we don't do we're all the time looking sad. That's supposed to be reverent. Look at the people of God in the Old Testament. Man, when they had agricultural feasts dedicated to God, you talk about a hoopla, a hootenanny, put on the glad rags friends, get out the dancing tennis shoes, that's the people of God. And we've just turned it into a stick in the mud. I tell you what, if I had a choice between joining the world and joining the church, I'd join the world most of the time because half the churches are so grumpy looking. I don't think Christianity is grumpy. I think it is joyful, hilarious relationship with God. He's going to turn the fast into feast. I wish we could catch, I wish we could catch the joy of the Jewish people over knowing God. It revolutionized our lives. He said, there ain't going to be no more fast. Put on the glad rags. I'm here again. Chapter, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it will, be, it will yet be that peoples will come, even inhabitants of many cities. Oh, what's this now? A new turn is being made. The inhabitants of one will go to another saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. <laughs> Look at verse 22. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. What we're talking about, friends, is nothing less than a worldwide exodus. Protestants, Jews, Catholics, in time, all people coming unto God. Jews and Gentiles, all the races, all the languages, saying, hey, let's go to Jerusalem. Now, this is, this is not a new theme in the Old Testament. It's not a new theme in the book of Zechariah. Look at, uh, let's look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. Isaiah 66, 18 and following. Even the book of Zechariah, it's nothing new. Chapter 2, verse 11, there is coming a day when people are going to flow to God. All peoples. Look at verse 23. For thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men, number of completeness, from the nations of every language, man alive, I bet those Jews just fell on the floor. National Israel was about to cease to exist and universal people of God was coming in. You know what I thought about when I thought of all the languages of every nation? I thought about Acts chapter 2, verse 5, Pentecost, when every country almost in the known world was there. And even more than that, man, I, my heart started dancing when I thought of Revelation 5, the new song, Worthy is the Lamb. Every kindred, tongue, and tribe began to sing a new song. Thou art worthy. Hallelujah, I'm going to be in the choir yet. <laughs> I, and will grasp the garment of a Jew. Now, notice what this, notice what this is saying. Ten men are going to grab every Jew's clothes and say, let's go worship your God. 
Now, what is this cult? That's ten people to one. That's a bunch of folks, right? What is this metaphor about grabbing a, a Jew's garment? Well, there's a couple of metaphors here, probably. To cover someone with your skirt. Now, of course, I get so tickled. People say, men shouldn't wear women's clothes and vice versa. And by that, we mean that pants that shoot shouldn't be in church. Now, that is just ridiculous. Because men used to wear skirts. Huh? Ain't that the pit? See how easy we make it cultural? To grab a man's skirt or to put your skirt around somebody was a form of protection, inclusion. Also, we know to grab someone's clothes, their, their robe, was to say, I want to be reconciled to you. Let's talk about it. Don't leave. Now, whether it's uh, protection or reconciliation, or they're just saying, I'm going to hang on, fellow, no matter where you go, I don't know, but uh, that's, it's going to be a flowing unto God. Uh, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Notice we switch from Yahweh, the covenant name for God, to El, the general name of God. I think this is a beautiful chapter. I think it closes in an exciting way. Uh, it, I think it's neat. Questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, I, you know, the Jews made it a, such a ritual thing. Pharisees fasted three times a week, and they looked real sorrowful. So everybody know they were spiritual. <laughs> I think there probably is still an appropriate place in the life of the Christian for a religious fast. All of us need to probably physically fast. We're just too fat in our culture. Just eat too much of the wrong kind of food. I don't think it'd be something we could tell someone to do every certain day. But I know when I have major, major decisions to make and do not know what to do, then I think it's very appropriate for my lifestyle. Um, so I think there are periods in individual Christians' lives where these things are very important. The Bible talks quite often about fasting in the New Testament. So I think as long as it's not a ritual that we think impresses God, but if it's a sincere devotion to spend more time with Him and dedicate our full faculties on uh, knowing His will, then I think it can be very meaningful. Though it, I would be very difficult in saying we all ought to do it, say, one day or something. <laughs> Do y'all want an outline to prove you've been here, Matthews? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, Dorothy. Mm-hmm. The Jews were a tricky bunch, and by that I mean, and I'm talking about Jesus' day is all I know of, really, rabbinical Judaism. They would do things like, if you swore by God's throne, it wasn't binding. But if you swore by God's footstool, it was binding. If you swore by his beard, it wasn't binding. If you swore by his hat, it was binding. You see what I'm doing? And so that's why Jesus condemns that kind of thing in Matthew 5 so much. The reason this is so bad... What they would say is, as the Lord lives, so and so. Well, what they've just done is bring God into their lives. And that, what that is, is breaking uh, the commandment about taking God's name in vain, Exodus 27. It's not... Uh, I get real tickled today, even in modern, modern court. I was in court the other day, and they want me to swear to God that I was telling the truth. Well, that kind of ticked me off for two reasons. If I'm a Christian, I don't have to swear to tell the truth. And if I'm not a Christian, what difference it made to swear to God anyway? You know, if I didn't believe in Him, what, what would I, why wouldn't I lie and swear to God too? So what they're trying to do is call on the wrath of God on you if you lie. Well, what the Bible says is just let your yes be yes and your no be no and get on with it. The reason that's so funny that the, the people in our day want us to swear is the vast majority of us are just pathetic liars most of the time. 
true or not true? Sure. I don't going to be a stick out of a sore thumb. <laughs> no, Judge, I don't. <laughs> she didn't know. I just did it and went on. <laughs> you used to, you had to put your hand in the Bible. Remember that? If the Bible's holy to you, you wouldn't lie anyway. If it wasn't, what difference do you care? You know? It's kind of like our little things about, you've heard the cross your heart and hope to die, stick a needle. What is that junk anyway? You know, it's... <laughs> So the problem is bringing God's name into it, you know, swearing to tell the truth to God and then lie like a dog. I think we'll reap consequences from that. I guess one reason I think modern divorce is so bad is not because it just, you know, be just the deal about uh, breaking up homes, but have you ever thought that when you take a marriage vow, you just call God into it? You just promise some things to that other person, but you promise some things to them through God. That makes it extremely binding and uh, boo, croak. I remember one time, I used, to, uh, I used to love to smoke. Oh, I loved it. The little cherry cigars, wonderful, wonderful things. And so I was, <laughs> one night I was just trying to, to, I said, you know, I don't have any cows to sacrifice. How could I show the Lord that I love him? I, you know, kill a sheep in my living room in his apartment house. What do you do? I said, well, I'll just... I just, I'll just promise you I enjoy smoking so much, I'll just give it up because I love you. Man, did I regret that. Because I love to smoke. And so um, I found a place in the Old Testament wisdom that said, God never told you to make a promise to him, but if you make one, you better keep it. I thought, dead gum. Why, why didn't I read that first? Because, you know, I, I don't have any theological problems with tobacco, really. But I have real problems with me breaking that vow that I made to him. I really do. So I, I don't make many vows anymore. Matter of fact, I love to sit next to folks smoking cherry cigars. <laughs> Cut the tape off, would you? Not there. Let's pray then. Any questions? I'm, I'm open to talk. Lord, I... Uh, I don't know when all this is referring to, but it seems to me it must be a great day is going to happen. Jews and Gentiles are going to join hands finally and come to you. Lord, I, I can in my mind see every skin color and hear every language praising your name, see every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus is Lord. God, I'm so excited I'm going to be there. I'm so excited I've met you this side of that experience that I can be there as a child. Lord, I, uh, I, I don't know if I want you to come in my lifetime or not. Lord, it's going to be so neat for me and my family who know you, but God, it's going to be such a bad day for those who don't. So many people that we really haven't... Uh, told yet. We just haven't been real faithful with the commission you've given us, Lord. We've, we've huddled all the Christians here in one country and all the money here. And God, I'm, not, I'm just not sure I want that day to come, but I'm so thankful I'm not afraid of it. I'm so thankful in your time it'll come. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for the promises and prophecies of hope that sustain us when our personal lives are not understandable. It's hard for me to imagine how much the Jews hurt when they lost their temple and lost their land and lost their king and all of those things you promised them. And I'm sure, Lord, I wouldn't understand either. But I'm thankful that I live in a time that I understand about Jesus and I pray you'd help me be faithful in telling others. Keep me, I pray, a joyful Christian and not a solemn Christian. I pray we'd live in such a way that who we are in you might be catching to others. In Jesus' name, amen.